Hey friends, and welcome back to the Rewind podcast of Forward Church. Join us each week as we take a look back on Sunday's message and dig a little deeper into the conversations with those who are teaching across our sites at Forward. We want to invite you to be part of the conversation too. So if something we're talking about on Sunday morning sparks a question in you, head to our website forwardchurch.ca slash ask us and submit your questions there. And we're going to do our best to engage with those questions in this space. With that said, let's jump in and get started. Well, hey, welcome to the podcast this week. You'll notice some of us are sitting in spaces we're not used to sitting in. Um, Andrew is not in the host spot, and I'm in a seat I don't often sit in anymore. I haven't preached in a while, and and so I've, I haven't been on the podcast for a little bit, but I'm going to do my best. This might be a little bit of amateur hour or amateur half hour. We'll try to keep it to that. We don't want it to be an amateur hour. That would, that would be painful. It would be. It would be. We wouldn't want to stay there. But um, yeah. Andrew, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. I'm headed next Monday on two weeks of vacation. So mm. I'm just, you know, getting things lined up so that I can go away and be away. So nice. Excited about that. Nice. We're doing the same. I'm only going for one week, but we're looking forward to that. Sucker. So. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't plan as well as you, apparently. <laughs> so, but yes, it's a good time of year to take those breaks and to spend time with family and all that as well. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, I am really glad we're back in the podcast studio. Yeah. I listened to the, the the podcast last week and it was just, oh, that sounds so much better. I can, yeah. I can deal with that. So, yeah. I put on the headphones last week and and I was like, oh my goodness, Zoom audio quality stinks. <laughs> like I just, you don't know how bad it is until you hear what it should sound like. It's so true. And uh, I think we're all a little bit done with Zoom at this point. So you might be right. The uh, registrations for our youth Zoom calls are <laughs> plummeting, especially because you can meet in person now. It's like, do you want to meet with a real human being or stare at a screen? Yeah, I think we all know what we're choosing in that. Yeah. I think there's some people that will miss Zoom, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, mm. I'm glad to be live again. It opens up lots of ministry opportunities. Like we're doing interviews for Lighthouse and stuff like that. And if it's hard to coordinate, you can do it on Zoom and still see somebody's face and interact in a much more humane way than just a phone call. But uh, yeah. It's so true. In person. Well, I think we, we've all been on this massive technology trajectory over the last number of months because I remember six months ago, someone would say, hey, can we do that over Zoom? And and the people that were kind of want, part of that meeting was like, do you know about Zoom? How does Zoom work? <laughs> what is Zoom? I'm scared of Zoom. Isn't that a massive? Yeah. Can we do a phone call? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> Let's stay away. Whereas now going forward, that's going to be easy yeah. to use, which will be good. So. So Andrew, you brought the message to us on Sunday. It was a, uh, it was good. You got to speak in front of a a live congregation. Human beings. It was wonderful. Yes, yes. It is nice to see that group coming out on Sundays, mm -hmm. and and then knowing that you're you're connecting with many many online as well. Yeah. So. Uh, we're thankful for our congregation and the way they connect with us. Now, um, we're still in First Peter. Yep. Uh, it's been a fantastic message. And, and I just, every week I'm blown away with how we, we picked out the, the sermon series. You're part of the, the, yeah, yeah. the, the teaching team um, and, and uh, the sermon series design team. And I remember when we talked about First Peter, we had no clue really what church was going to look like, mm -hmm. uh, what the struggles were that we were going to be dealing with in yeah. that season. And every week I'm blown away by the sovereignty of God and how he put this together. And these are, these are topics that are so relevant yeah. to today. Yeah. It, I believe it is a, the word there. Sovereignty is like absolutely perfectly chosen. And we were chatting earlier, man, like this book is rich. Mm -hmm. I had one heck of a passage <laughs> and there's lots on the cutting room floor in my office at home um, from this because it's just such a thick passage of, of like you could probably easily do a series out of that section of scripture in and of itself. So, um, oh yeah, God's, God's got a lot to say to us. There's no shortage of that. No, no. And, and the relevancy of scripture never ceases to amaze me. Mm -hmm. it, what was relevant in, in the early church days comes into our days, you know, even in social media, you, all these new forms of communication, yeah. scripture still has relevancy to it yeah, and yeah. speaks to it and, and, uh, helps us in that. So, um, now if, uh, someone maybe didn't catch all of your message or, um, 
um, got distracted by a plane flying over during the message or right. something like that. What is the, if you could distill your 30 minute message on Sunday into a five minute uh, kind of recap, what would be the main point you'd want people to take away from Sunday? So I want, I want people to understand that the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ is what should shape our reactions. The fact that we have been rescued, redeemed, and loved beyond measure when we didn't deserve it, while we were still enemies of God, he sent his son to die for us. That should be the driving force that shapes our reactions. Sort of use the linchpin verse in there, uh, 15, like uh, I'm just going to read it so I don't misquote scripture because that would be a terrible thing to do on the podcast here. Uh, we would hear about it. There'd be emails. <laughs> I don't want you to have emails because I'll be on vacation. You have to deal with them. Uh, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. That would be that what has happened to us informs how we live that out. Our, and there's a lot of stuff that surrounds that in the scripture, but I think that's sort of the the linchpin that holds it all together, that we're, our reaction to others should be re- rooted in our relationship with Christ. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. And and, nice. and I think that that speaks to just the Christian life, right? Mm. Is Now, our reactions <laughs> are, are going to be all across the border <laughs> there. I think... Um, you know, just of, of that process, the sanctification, that, there's a big yeah. word we can throw in there, um, just uh, how God slowly works in our hearts. So our reactions as new Christians might be a little different from those that are really mature Christians and walking close mm-hmm. with the Lord. Yeah. Um, I think of um, some of the, the heroes of the faith in my mind that I've, my grandparents and uh, my parents and others over the years, as, as I've looked to them, I'm like, how do you react in such a way Mm-hmm. That is so calm and steady and gentle when the world is up against you. Yeah. And in my teens, my raging teens, <laughs> I couldn't understand it. But it, it's really a work of the Spirit. And as we yeah. come to really fully understand the gospel mm-hmm. and the work of Christ in our, our lives, it, it helps us to react a little bit better, right? Yeah. And the setting setting of your in, setting in your heart, Christ apart as Lord and holy, is what shapes that. And mm-hmm. sometimes you need to reset right? Like there's, um, our relationship with Jesus is a dynamic thing as it is with anybody, right? We're, and Steve had a beautiful line on the podcast three or four weeks ago where he said, you know, our relationship with God isn't about duration, it's about proximity, that mm. that having Christ at the center and being rooted in everything, right? And then we stray, uh, the old hymn, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. <laughs> um, and to just draw our hearts back. And that was really how I wanted to end the message is to say like, hey, let's just recenter ourselves on the person and work of Jesus because that's that's what's going to be the fuel that allows us to do this, right? We've all been told like, hey, be better. Don't do that. <laughs> like, don't be a jerk when somebody's a jerk to you. you yeah. Know, turn the other cheek. We all, we know those things, but sometimes we don't have the capacity, the fuel within us to do that we can't drum that up in our own heart. I, I can't even remember if I actually got to this point in my notes where I said, like, if we look at what Jesus says about the heart, it's not very uh, flattering, <laughs> right? <laughs> he knows it. Yeah. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks out of it comes uh, adultery, slander, vile things. And you're just like, Hey, maybe if I'm, if I'm drawing from that well to accomplish the things that God asked me to, like that is incongruent. It's a non sequitur. That will not happen. We need Christ at the center of our hearts to reform and renew and be rooted in the person and work of Jesus if we're ever even going to have a shot at that. Mm. And that'll, that, again, that's a, the process of sanctification is a circular thing, right? You, you grow close and you're intimate and then uh, you're drawn away and then God is gracious and loving and brings us back, which should shape our reactions, right? Yep. How, how gracious has God been to us when we suffer the same thing over and over and over again, or he has to like <laughs> live with us through our own stupidity and foibles and then graciously welcomes us back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you had to preach after, um, uh, pastor Neil's little, uh, mm. kids devotional there, which was a bit of a mic drop moment. Cause I hadn't seen that before or heard that, that mm. demonstration. Yeah. And, uh, he got up. I never know what Neil's going to talk about. And yeah. he's like, what's he doing with sponges on the stage? Yeah. And for those of you that didn't see it, he he uh, had some some sponges in um, in water. One was clear water. One was blue water. And basically was talking about what we soak up is what we're going to put out. And as the sponges soaked up the clean water and, and soaked up the blue water, 
obviously the one that soaked up clean water let out clean water, the one that soaked up blue water. And it's that proximity to Christ is going to start coming out in us. And I was like, oh, well, how brilliant. Yeah. Um, does and Andrew need to say anything at this point? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, Yeah, and I think, again, the hope of the gospel reshapes that. It's, it's not about us being like, hey, let's get the water more clean that we're drawing from. No, we will always be tainted, and we are in desperate need of Jesus. And uh, I had one line in there that I really wanted to build out, but I was up against the clock and didn't get to get there. But... <laughs> Um, often when we're offended, right? When, when there's, you know, persecution or mistreatment or abuse, we can, we can get to a moral high ground in, in ourselves and play the victim. Mm. You know, we often think of the victim as a lowly spot. And I think sometimes there's like a downtrodden, beaten down sort of element to that. But there's also a moral high ground that says like, how dare you do that? I don't have to forgive you because of the egregious thing that you did to me. And it actually puts us in a position of moral authority over that person. And if you take that spot, there's no room to have a gospel centered reaction mm. unless you realize the ground is level at the foot of the cross and we are in equal need of redemption and grace through the cross. If the gospel isn't shaping that in your heart, you're gonna, even in pain, be arrogant mm. and self righteous. Mm -hmm. I would never do what to someone what that person did to me, right? We've said those sorts of things. How could that person do that thing? That's a statement of moral superiority that has no ground. If you if you read verse eight that we, we started with, right? Like humility of mind, right? Like understanding in sympathy and with tenderhearted compassion, other people and above all love. Hmm. It's too bad you missed that. I know. And this is why you got to listen to the <laughs> Rewind podcast because you get the best pieces. Uh, I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's it's absolutely true. Um, so we'll speak to Neil about missing that part in his illustration. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Neil. Uh, um, you know, it's as as I was as I was listening to your message and and as I looked through the passage because as you said, like we could do a three or four sermon series just Easily. out of the passage that you dealt with on Sunday. And I mean, that's so true of most scripture. Like right. it, it's, it's just dense in its, its teaching and its, uh, its wisdom. Um, but, you know, I, as I look back on, on the whole series and just this, you know, how to, to live mm -hmm. as a scattered people in a broken world um, and, and how to live in the darkness, uh, light, be light in the darkness, um, where, where we've been hearing through some of the, the different messages recently, I, um, I started thinking through, you know, what it's like to be so, some of the stuff I've experienced as a pastor. Right. Now, now you've, you've got the title pastor too. Right. So you recognize um, as soon as you go into the community and your neighbors know you're a pastor. Yeah. And, and it reminded me of the story I heard of this pastor that was, was building a gazebo in his backyard and the neighbor's kid was outside and, you know, he's standing up on a ladder with a hammer, nailing some of the gazebo together. And, and this kid, he just figured was going to, disappear after a while like how exciting is this to watch and, and after about 15 20 minutes the kid's still watching him hammer away and uh so the pastor stops comes down the, off the ladder and, and 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 goes and chats to the neighbor kid and says hey so are you interested in construction like what is fascinating you about me building this gazebo and and, and the the neighbor kid just said you know no i'm, I'm actually more interested just to hear what your reaction is going to be and what you're going to say when you hit your thumb <laughs> What does a pastor say? <laughs> yep, we've all been there. Um, but sometimes we can feel as pastors and sometimes as Christians, as your neighbors get to know that you're mm -hmm. a Christian, that you're living in a bit of a, uh, a glass bowl. Yeah. And people are watching your reaction. They're waiting for you to slip up. They're waiting for you to swear. Mm -hmm. um, they're waiting for you to, to do that, to have that un, uh, what they would call an ungodly reaction. Yep. Um, and, and so it can get stressful. Um, if you think in those terms all the time, right. I know as a pastor going out and you start seeing people in the community, you know, they're from the church and you're at Zares, you're at Chopper's Drug Mart. And, yeah. and, and that, that thought does go through your head. Like, you know, um, what, what's, what, what, how are they going to view me? Yeah. Um, um, but really as we live in Christ mm -hmm. and as we live out the gospel, that should be yeah. enough, right? That should be reshaped, right? Because yeah. uh, we are, you know, scripture calls us ambassadors of Christ reconciliation. We are, the carriers of the message of hope. But the message of hope isn't that gospel makes you a good person, right? That you hit your thumb and you go, well, I wish that didn't happen, <laughs> right? Um, we're going to slip up because if, if it's about us being good people, 
we forego the need for Jesus, mm-hmm. right? Again, our reactions need to be centered on the gospel that I need to throw myself on the mercy of God expressed through Jesus, mm-hmm. just the same as you and me and everybody else, right? So if we start to think, hey, it's our responsibility to be good, strong, moral, nice people, then that's what's going to be the defense of our hope, right? Like if people are watching, they will ask us about that hope, but it's not because you were the nice guy at the office Christmas party, right? It's <laughs> it's not because you you didn't swear when you hit your thumb with a hammer. Well, you shouldn't do that, but maybe it happens, right? But it's not about us being righteous in and of ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's about Jesus. We have to be people who are ambassadors of a greater hope. We are not the message. We are the carriers of the message, and the message is founded in you know the author and perfecter of our faith, not mm-hmm. us. So don't, don't put that pressure on yourself because it no. never belonged there to begin with. Exactly, uh, which reminded me, again, just of, of as a pastor, a young pastor, um, uh, I, I was invited over to someone in our church's home and uh, another young guy, we were both in our early 20s, and um, we we're hanging out with, with, um, with each other just over lunch and chatting. And he's like, hey, uh, do you play video games? I'm like, yeah. And he pulled out uh, NFL, whatever the NFL game was at that time. And, and I got just as competitive with him. And he's like, <laughs> I didn't think you would be competitive. You're a pastor. I'm like, what, what did you? I guess he expected me to sit there and, and be really quiet and... Um, but Just let you, you win, you, yeah, You're exactly. For an easy W. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I can be competitive, yep. um, uh, and uh, I mean, I don't think I did anything wrong there. But just that expectation that mm-hmm. that we're going to be different, right? Yeah. Um, but and and when you talk about having equality at the foot of the cross, mm-hmm. um, you know, as Christians, like we're all there, yep. and we can't sit in a moral high ground. We mm-hmm. we we need to love from that place. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, it comes across in a way it shouldn't. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the passage here talks a lot about the blessing that we have been called to, to and to the, be. to be. So we need to recognize both directions there that, you know, often I was actually having a conversation. We were talking about some ministry stuff, and he said, you know, often we ask people to do some moral do-gooding without the fuel necessary to do that, that we haven't been shaped by the word of God. We haven't been deeply connected to the spirit of God and like rooted and centered and intimately connected to Jesus. Because outside of that, you're just a nice person. And I think a lot of what we struggle with in North American church is that we think being nice and good and friendly is enough. (laughs) And it's not. There's people who are way nicer than me who don't know Jesus, yeah. right? Like genuinely lovely human beings. Mm-hmm. But outside of the hope found in Jesus, they're lost, right? Mm. If if it's found in my own behavior, right? Jesus had to come because my behavior was never going to accomplish what he needed to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So, Very true. Um. So, you know, as I was reading through that scripture passage, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, I guess, you, you again, a couple of messages you could have preached out of this yeah. on Sunday, but reading through, you know, verses 8 through 12 just speaks to all these beautiful qualities of a Christ follower. Yeah. And, uh, you know, finally, all of you, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking to husbands and wives, we've been talking to, to, to the slaves and masters relationship, mm-hmm. but now all of you, all of you that are Christ followers, and you, you, you kind of went on that, um, you do these things, this is how you should look. Right. But then we hit verse 12, and there's persecution. Right. But if we're all these things, why are we persecuted? Um, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I would say, first and foremost, that's an ideal that can only be achieved in Jesus, right? <laughs> like, that that doesn't happen. But also, plot twist, like, Jesus was all those things and was still crucified, right? Yes, like, yeah. That the message of the cross is offensive, right? Foolishness to the Greeks and, like, you know, a stumbling block to those who are perishing. If, if we are trying to establish self-righteousness, the message of the gospel is an offense to our ears that you will never be good enough is a message that puts people on their heels and don't love to hear mm. until you come to that place of humility where you can accept the love of Jesus as is ex- extended to you. That's going to be a stumbling block and it will be offensive no matter how kind and unified we are and love like loving people who represent Jesus that will still be an offense to somebody who is outside of the kingdom of God. And even to those of us who are still trying to wrestle to the ground, what the gospel means for our lives, because 
I get offended. I wish that I was good enough on my own. Like if mm-hmm. I'm really honest, I'm a firstborn, do it right, <laughs> yell at yourself when you mess up kind of person. And I just want to get it right every time. And I need the hope of the gospel mm. to do that. I was um, cooking with my second born son, Seth, yesterday. Uh, and it was an absolute <laughs> hot mess. He's really good in the kitchen. He's only eight and he's like probably better than most grown men in the kitchen. Like can follow a recipe, do everything on his own. But he was having a tough time, you know, dropped an egg on the floor, tried to open a thing of milk and just absolute <laughs> mess everywhere. And then he was doing something else that was very precarious. And I was like, buddy, I'm just going to take that from you and do this for you. And, you know, I, I was didn't get to do much cooking because I was wiping up egg and milk. And I just had to sit there washing out the cloth from all the stuff that was in it. And I was like, man, like, God, you are so good to me. When I... M- fumble and drop things and make the same mistake inside of 20 minutes over and over again. You are a patient and loving heavenly father. And I really believe it was the spirit of God working this message in my own heart that I didn't blow up at him because like, <laughs> <laughs> after like accident three in about a 15 minutes span, I was like, whoo, but it was just a reminder like, Hey, didn't you just preach a message on how your reaction <laughs> should be shaped on how much I love you? I was like, yeah. okay, Lord, I'm listening. I don't want to have to learn this lesson much more. <laughs> Please, yeah. I want to actually eat dinner tonight. Isn't it amazing how our kids Ugh. bring out the gospel, or at least our need for it, <laughs> our need for it, um, and and just put that spotlight? Because I mean, yeah, so often I, I get those moments where I'm as a father, and my reaction is not what it should be, right. and there I am suddenly reminded of. Right. I need to spend more time in scripture. I need to spend more time with yeah. God because um, that is pointing out mm-hmm. a flaw in my reaction. Yeah, the law is a mirror, right? It, it yeah. shows us the dirt on our face. It won't clean us up. That's Jesus' job, but the law will show us where the dirt is for sure. Yeah, and if you want to know where I mess up, <laughs> speak to my kids. <laughs> they do have the front row seat. It's super unfair. It is, it is. And they are tremendously gracious as well with me, so I'm thankful for the gospel working in their hearts. <laughs> Uh, it's uh it's good so um now you know it's it's interesting i was as i was looking at that passage there um and and you had mentioned verse 15 being kind of central to where mm-hmm. you were landing um you know uh verse 15 reads uh but in your hearts honor christ the lord is holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a verse that's quite well known. Yeah. Right? Always be ready with the defense. Yeah. And that's the portion that we, we yeah. remember. I heard it horribly misquoted in the podcast yesterday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, it, it's it's interesting because, you know, I, I've I, that's a, a verse I've known my whole life. Always mm-hmm. be ready with the defense. And, uh, you know, and so you, you want to make sure you've got arguments right. that can answer questions that people have. And, um, but I think so often we miss the second part of that verse, Mm -hmm. um, because, um, for, for those who, who, who might not know that word defense in the Greek is apologia, Mm -hmm. which brings out the apologetics and understanding that giving a defense for your faith, faith is apologetics and Mm -hmm. making an apology, you know, that brings up different things in our minds and understanding that, but being able to explain, yeah. It's not... Yeah, a reasoned, logical explanation yeah. is sort of the how the verse break or that word breaks down in Greek. Whereas as a rugby player growing up, I was always told the best defense is offense. <laughs> and so so I, I hear, give a defense. I'm like, oh, I've got to argue this and I've got to have yeah. the right answer and make sure they know they're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you get to the end of verse 15 there and it says, yet do this with gentleness and respect. Mm-hmm. How do you see that playing out in social media and places today, Andrew, That's do you an have some examples? That's starting point. <laughs> um, I, I would want to remind anybody who finds themselves in that spot just to, to remind you that no one has ever been argued into the kingdom. Mm. If you've been in those conversations at all, as soon as your back gets up, that's going to be the reaction of the other person, right? That there is a defensiveness. And when, you're, when you are on the defensive, um, you're not listening. You're looking for a counterattack. Yeah. Um, so the hope of the gospel, again, there is a, a sense in which we want a logical reasoned faith that, you know, can be explained and understood, at least to some extent. There is a mystery of God that we will never wrap our 
heads around until we get to heaven and meet him face to face. But our defense is the name of Jesus. He is our defender. It, we don't have to, uh, you know, have the, you know, Romans road memorized and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Jesus actually says to his disciples, like, like, don't even worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give you the words when you need it, that Christ is our defender. And, and I don't want to, you know, leave out the necessity of people who do brilliant work, mm. people like Francis Collins, people like Tim Keller, who just have like deep faith in Jesus and can articulate highly complex things in ways that people can connect with and understand and open people up to the work of Jesus. But if we think it's our job to convict people of their sin and to convince them that God is real, we have horribly misapplied for a position that is already taken, right? That's the spirit of God and the work of Jesus in their hearts. So we're not meant to do that. Now we do have to have a lot, we have to be able to give a defense for our faith, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can't articulate the gospel, then I think you need to do some work there to have a logical reason defense of why you need Jesus. I believe that you do, but do you believe that you do? Because some some of us who would call ourselves followers of Jesus try to live in our own strength and you know with our own equipment along the way. And when what we need is the, our defender is Jesus. And important point here that didn't get left out of scripture is we need to do that with the gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. That's why you know on a lot of the issues that a lot of Christians align with. They love listening to people like a Ben Shapiro or a Jordan Peterson who aren't Christians, just like newsflash, um, but understand scripture mm -hmm. and have a lot of Judeo-Christian values and can argue them beautifully. Like if I have to defend abortion, I'm sending Ben Shapiro. I'm not going to do that. He will have way more facts and way more understanding. But I would never want to talk to Ben Shapiro about that in, in real life if I had the other side because I feel like he would be condemning and speak down to me. All the things in verse 8 about like humility of mind and tenderheartedness and love are out the window. And if our defense doesn't line up with our calling and character, then we've totally just absolutely wiped that out, right? We're, we're doing more harm than good when mm -hmm. that's how we're defending ourselves. And also, like, God doesn't really need us to defend him, right? Like, he's been fine for eternity. I don't think he needs a bunch of, like, mid-30 white guys sitting here in Cambridge to, to come up with the, like, spear that's going to absolutely undo everyone else's counterpoints, right? Like, he'll be okay. Mm -hmm. We have a great and powerful God, and it's not your job to defend him. He actually defends you, mm. just so you know. And, and I like your answer there. We need to rely on God yeah. in this. And, um, you know, uh, we do have to have a defense mm -hmm. and something that we can say. But I think we often forget that that, that verse often sits on its own. Yeah. Right? Uh, and and you you always have to put verses in context of where they come from. And so, so where he's saying with gentleness and respect, let's go back to verse eight. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, sympathy brotherly love, and a tender heart yeah. and a humble mind. Like do all these things in that moment. Right. Yeah. Um, can't and divorce those things from one another. No, no, you can't. And, uh, and this is the beauty of scripture. It, it gives us a, an outline of mm -hmm. how we should react, how we should live, uh, and how we should have a gospel-centered reaction to mm -hmm. people as you mentioned earlier, right? So, yeah. Um, and then on the tail end, he gives you the gospel, right? Like verse 18 is what most theologians yeah. would say is like one of the most concise and clear summaries of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, Christ was the righteousness for the unrighteousness. He died in our, in our place. So if you, if you're somebody who says like, ah, I love Jesus. I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. And I don't have an understanding of how to articulate the gospel. Start there. Like, just read that. Also, like, Romans, if you can uh, get yourself into the book of Romans, man, like, that will be an unbelievable starting point for you to understand the hope of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So um, any other additional thoughts? Maybe what, what were some of the books that you read, uh, commentaries maybe, that you spent time in, in prepping for your message that would be helpful to those that want to? Um, I don't know how many people want to read like a D.A. Carson or a Holman commentary. If you His stuff is good. He's brilliant. <laughs> I've heard him speak in uh, Heritage a few years back, and I was just like, felt like my mind was being blown constantly. Yeah. It was him speaking on how to preach apocalyptic uh, passages. Ooh. And I was like, after about two hours of it, I was like, I just need a break. <laughs> Don, just like chill. 
Um, so yeah, brilliant guy. Um, yeah, so I, I read a number of commentaries. One of the things I'd love to just sort of throw out there, there's like after verse 19 to 22 is a highly complex passage that I had to just brush over. Mm -hmm. Um, it talks now, about, now's your chance. Yeah, it talks about like Christ preaching to the spirits in prison in the days of Noah. There being, uh, you know, God patient, God being patient while the ark is being built, and then again goes to the end of the, the authority of Jesus. Um, and I wanted to summarize that and say, like, hey, God's wrath is a real thing, mm. right? Like, there is a righteous sacrifice for un unrighteousness for a reason because you know, you know, the wages of sin is death and. The gift, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ, right? So don't forget the second half of that. But sometimes as followers of Jesus, we want to talk about the hope of the gospel, but we forget about how hopeless we are without it. Um, and I think there's so many like fun and interesting, or not fun, but like very interesting uh, different reads on that in the commentaries. And I just felt like if I was going to dig into it in a sermon, it would be super distracting and completely unhelpful for people who are actually trying to dig into it. Um, but there's, some people would say that, this is a uh, scriptural uh, teaching that Jesus went down into hell and preached to the spirits in prison who had been held captive until he had victory on the cross. So um, some people would land there. Some people would say that Jesus actually manifest himself through the person of Noah to preach to those in prison um, in the days of Noah, which I was like, huh, that they would call that a Christophany in, in theological terms. Um, so there's just like a bunch of interesting things that I feel like, hey, we could we could spend a lot of time in turmoils, but uh, there's uh, in the pastoral epistles that talks a lot about, you know, not spending your time on genealogies and, <laughs> and things that won't produce faith and love. So I didn't want to do that because scripture tells me not to do that. So I didn't. Um, but yeah, very interesting. If you're one of those people who loves to like scratch their head on deep theological things, like spend some time in verses like 18 through 22, because there's a lot of different interpretations and you could really wrestle some fun stuff to the ground there. Mm -hmm. No, lots, lots of, and, and then I, I loved how you, you, you mentioned that is a beautiful summary of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I love how that, again, we speak about how scripture is laid out beautifully and mm -hmm. that, that, uh, you know, always having a defense for your faith sat there and is, is a verse that many of us are familiar with and, and use frequently, yeah. but make sure you know what it's yeah. and he hands surrounded you by. Yeah. You're gonna Here's the gospel. Guys. Yeah. Uh, it's there. And uh, so, you know, spend a little bit of time in that. Mm -hmm. Anything else that got chopped down on the floor and that we missed this week that you'd love to, to have our listeners know about wrestle through, mm. uh, there's a bunch of like really interesting things that again, I don't know that we're ultimately helpful for the, the like preaching of the word of God. Uh, if you go back to verse eight um, in that, finally, all of you uh, start with unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tenderhearted and uh, humble mind. Uh, he, Paul use or Peter uses a very uh, Hebrew structure to point to, to a couple of things there. If you read it, there's five things, the middle one, you know, we always think if you want to, you want to drill a point home, you repeat it. Um, Actually, in that structure, the only thing that's only said once is love. And then there's like a sympathy and tenderheartedness are very similar words. And then the hum humility of mind and sympathy um, or uh, humility of mind and unity of mind are, again, linked. So you would think like, oh, the things that get repeated are actually the high point, but it's it's a chiastic structure. So it gets built to a high point and then comes back down, which I just thought was like an interesting thing that, you know, reinforces what scripture says that, you know, love is this greatest thing for us, like. Uh, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, you know, the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. like being the high points of teaching. So I was just like blown away at the consistency of scripture through that. But again, uh, to take five minutes out of a sermon and like teach people what a chiasm is and, uh, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff, didn't feel like it was ultimately helpful. But yeah, just a super rich passage that if you wanted to spend weeks and weeks and you yeah. definitely could. And Andrew says you might get bored reading commentaries, but you won't. They're fascinating. Yeah. Because if you read the the right ones. The right ones, yes. Yeah. yeah. Trying to read Matthew Henry is like <laughs> it's a slug. But Yeah. But uh putting those alongside your scripture reading can mm -hmm. be helpful. Yeah. And uh can reveal things that maybe you haven't thought through. Mm -hmm. So um but appreciate it. I appreciate your time as you put into this this week, Andrew, and your your focusing of our hearts on the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if there's anything that we need to really focus on, it's the gospel of Christ. And just that no matter where we're at, mm -hmm. 
that that is what changes us and that that's what brings about yeah heart change right so mm-hmm. yeah it, no matter how mature in the faith you think you are we're still in desperate need of jesus yes yeah. and and at that moment that you think you're mature some something yeah. in your life is going to remind you you're not and yeah. there's a long way to go um yeah and think about it with kids right like the number of times that we get arrogant our kids are like you know i could totally do that and you're like i don't i don't think that that's true that that self-assurance is actually a sign of immaturity not maturity Hmm. very true well thank you and uh we uh look forward to continuing our series this week with pastor greg Mm -hmm. Uh, it will be good um but uh it's uh been good hanging out with you today it's kind of nice to be on this side of the microphone yeah i feel a little bit like at lo- i brought my laptop here just so i had buttons to press so i <laughs> i didn't feel completely out of control yeah no well i got control now I so know, it terrifies me um but uh thanks for joining us this week on the rewind podcast don't forget if you've got questions coming out of sunday morning uh go to fourchurch.ca slash ask us send us your questions we'd love to hear them we'd love to answer them and uh yeah we look forward to seeing you next week and spending time with you on the rewind podcast